Hello, everyone. On behalf of the On Being Project and the Washington National Cathedral, welcome to Poetry Unbound Plus with Padre Gotuma, featuring our special guest poet, Lorna Goodison, this evening or afternoon or wherever uh, you are joining us from. Um, we are so excited that you're here for this time of opening our hearts and imaginations in a conversation about poetry and the literature of the Bible. Uh, my name is Ben Cott. I'm the Associate Director of Religious Life and Social Healing at the On Being Project, uh, a media and non a nonprofit media and public life initiative pursuing deep thinking and moral imagination, social courage and joy to renew inner life, outer life and life together. I'm joining you today from Milwaukee, Wisconsin, the Potawatomi, Ho-Chunk and Menominee homeland. And we want to acknowledge that many of you who are joining us are living on lands that have histories much older than most of the current occupants arrival. For you, we invite you to learn more about the native land you're living on, and we're dropping a link where you can find out more. Uh, we welcome you uh, wherever you are joining us from. Uh, as folks continue to arrive, we invite you to introduce yourself in the chat. Uh, you can share your name, where you're located right now, including um, the lands where you reside, if that's something you're aware of. And also feel free to share any organizational information or affiliations that um, you have that you feel are relevant to you being here today. Um, I'll be walking you through some Zoom details in a moment, but my colleague Lily Benowitz is providing updates in the chat. And so um, even before we get to that, if you wanna reach out to Lily directly uh, with questions or help, feel free to do so. So as we gather in this virtual space today, uh, in our chat and in our Q&A later, we want to invite you to strive with us to embody the six grounding virtues that guide everything we do at the On Being Project. Uh, Lily is entering those into the chat now. And um, these grounding virtues are um, important to our work. And we're also grateful to our friends and in our social healing community who use these grounding virtues in their own work as they're gathering and creating. Uh, if this is your first time seeing them, please know that they're there for you too as you gather outside of this space. Uh, with that, I would like to um, introduce you to our collaborator, uh, Terry Lynn from the Washington National Cathedral's Center for Prayer and Pilgrimage. So um, without any further ado, Terry Lynn Simpson, why don't you uh, come on and say hi to our assembled communities. Hello, greetings everyone. I'm Terry Lynn. I am joining you today from the suburbs of DC on Piscataway land. And I would just like to welcome you to this time to listen to poetry, to the wisdom of Padraig and Lorna as they tease out meanings and make connections as we connect with one another in this sacred space. Um, one of the six grounding virtues is hospitality and at the center part of our mission is to extend that hospitality, cathedral hospitality to all who come through our doors as pilgrims of all faiths and no faith. So welcome here today. Thank you. Thank you, Terry Lynn. So uh, before I turn things over to Padraig, who is our host for this conversation, I want to orient us to the Zoom space we're gathered in. I know many of you have probably used Zoom uh, over the course of the last year or so, um, but we want to make sure that everyone's able to join in the most comfortable way possible. So um, we want to give you a few insights for that. So obviously feel free to, to move in your own space wherever you're joining us from. Uh, you're welcome to turn off the screen if you want to make this uh, solely a listening experience. Um, but in addition to those things, we want you to know that there is uh, a closed captioning available. So you can use the um, CC button at the bottom of your Zoom window to turn this function on and off. We do invite you to turn on uh, your camera. You'll notice this isn't a Zoom webinar, which doesn't allow us to see one another, but it's actually a Zoom meeting. Um, so if you feel comfortable and you'd like to have your screen on, um, you are more than welcome to do that. That will create sort of, uh, I think, uh, intimate environment where we're, we're seeing who else is participating in this experience together. Uh, we will spotlight people as they speak. So um, when Podrick's speaking or Lorna, um, that's in a, a setting called speaker view. 
And you can either stay in that setting or you can select gallery view in the top right hand corner of your Zoom screen uh, in order to see everyone in the Zoom room uh, at the same time. Uh, do note that everyone but the speakers will be muted during this event. Later in the gathering, uh, you will have the opportunity to ask a question of our speakers directly. And um, if you are called on, we will, uh, we will give you the option to unmute at that time. And please do know that this event is being recorded. Uh, so if you raise your hand later during our Q&A, which we'll give instructions about then, um, you, if you raise your hand and we call on you, you are, you are giving your permission to be recorded. So with that, uh, we are going to turn off the chat until our Q&A later to provide focus and quiet to the conversation we're about to witness. And to enter into that space, if you'd like, I invite you to, to join me in taking a deep breath. Thank you. So now I want to introduce the host of our time together, Padraig Otuma. Um, Padraig is a poet and public theologian. He is the former leader of Cory Mila, Ireland's oldest peace organization. And here at the On Being Project, Padraig is our resident poet and theologian and the host of Poetry Unbound, which just this past week released its third season. Uh, tonight, he is our host of this third in a series of four installments of Poetry Unbound Plus. Padraig, welcome. Thanks very much, Ben. And thank you very much to Terry Lynn and to everybody for being here. You're um, also very, very welcome to this evening's conversation. And I'm thrilled um, that you're here. Just to let you know, this series started because um, I have a real interest in how poets approach the literature of scripture and how poets engage with the poetry of religion, whether that's liturgy or prayer or other forms within which religion communi communicates itself through poetry. And I, I really like um, viewing these texts through the lens of art, because I think something very new and very exciting can be unleashed really within these texts when we look at them as works of art. And um, tonight we are thrilled really to have uh, an opportunity to talk with Lorna Goodison. Um, Lorna is a major figure in world literature and she has 12 books of poetry and a new book of poetry coming out very soon, um, as well as memoirs and literary criticism and short stories. She's been widely anthologized. And Lorna was Poet Laureate of Jamaica from 2017 to 2020. And she was awarded the 2019 Queen's Gold Medal for Poetry and has won many awards for her work. And so Lorna, you're very, very welcome. It's a great joy to have you here. Okay, can you hear me now? There you are, I can hear you now. Lovely <laughs> yes. to see you, Lorna. I'm so glad to see you. Yes. Um, we've, had a, we've had a connection going back a couple of years, which has been lovely, various interviews and conversations yes. and emails. And it's always a great joy to hear from you and to read your work and to have an opportunity to be in conversation with you. So thank same. you very much for your generosity of time. Same here, same here. <laughs> well, um, I wonder if you could just, we're going to talk about three particular poems from your book, Oraka Bessa. Um, but I wonder if you could just uh, let folks know a little bit as we start about your journey into poetry. You, you hold a variety of arts within you. Um, and uh, I, I love for folks to hear about your journey into poetry and your love of painting as well. Well, for one, th hello everybody. It's just such an honor to be here. Thank you. I, I, this, I'm one of nine children and I grew up in a household with everybody has very, they all have very strong personalities. So I had to find my own niche in life fairly early. My eldest sister is a journalist very well known, very well regarded journalist. So I assumed that the job of writer was taken in my family. So I decided, well, I paint, so I'm a painter, but it was just something I could not help doing. I don't, don't, do not want to be melodramatic, but it's true. I just, I would, sometimes I got rid of them. I, I destroyed a lot of my poems. 
and it just kept coming. And at some point I made peace with it and I said, well, okay, this is what I do. I'm a poet. So, but it took me a while. It took me until I, I started publishing an anonymously at first, just under my initials. And then one day I just thought, you know what? I don't care if anybody knows I'm a poet. So then I put my name on them. But poetry for me is, has been my, a, my constant companion and friend. I really, really regard poetry as something that's a gift that is given one to make one's life easier. I cannot imagine what I would do if I had not been able to write poems. And um, I don't know if, you know, we, we, you're, okay, is that enough? Yeah, I think so. <laughs> no, no, keep going. No, no, no. I, I mean, I want to hear everything you have to say, Lorna. I mean, all, all I was going to say is that one time, I remember you saying that, like that for you to close up poetry in yourself was almost like causing a, a spiritual malaise within you. That it you was. Had to give that. It, it, it definitely was. I look back now and I see that had I not, you know, just welcomed it and saw, saw it for the gift that it is, that um, it would have damaged me and it was beginning to do me damage. I was making really bizarre choices. And I think that's because I was putting my energy in the wrong place. But that's what, yeah, I, I, I honestly believe that. Wow. Well, I mean, you have uh, an extraordinary volume of work and we'll tweet out over the next few days about this new book of yours. Um, I know it's being released um, with Carcanet in the UK. And my guess is that it's being released with other publishers in Canada and in the United States as well. Um, but we're going to particularly look at three poems from your book, Oracabessa. Yeah. And um, I wonder if you could start off by reading a cleansed petition and then we'll okay. um, talk a little bit about that. All right. A cleanse petition, or lady of sorrows, or lady star of the sea, or lady of banana walks, or lady of stately palm trees, tall once again after lethal yellow cut down disease, or lady of rain on the waves, or lady filler of fishing seines, or lady of gown of cobalt blue, wash our hearts, do cleanse blood spill of innocents who lose their heads, cleanse the ground we tread from grounding with grime of violence or lady of remedies. Um, I was looking at this poem, Lorna, this uh, poem, uh, our, our cleanse petition, and I was um, reading it through the lens of what the awarding committee in Yale said about your work after they gave you an award in 2018. They said that your poetry draws us into a panoramic history of a woman's life, bearing witness to female embodiment, the colonial legacy, mortality, and the sacred. And I think in so many of your poems, shorter ones and long ones, you bear witness to all of these things. And in this poem, there's place and women and lament and prayer and colour and a, a protest too and a, a deep desire. Where is it that your heart is drawn into as you look at this poem now? Well, I was driving through the parish of St. Mary. Jamaica is divided into 14 parishes and a lot, a lot St. Mary, St. Anne, but St. Mary's Parish. And I was thinking of Our Lady and the mother of, and, you know, and I just, and I think I drove by a church that was called Our Lady Star of the Sea. Mm -hmm. But I'm always thinking about the world and where my part, you know, my part of the world where, where I come from, Jamaica. And just, it was just one of those days when I felt there was a little, maybe a thin space in, in the universe where I could cry out to, to Our Lady and say, the very first school I ever went to was a Roman Catholic school. So I, I grew up learn I, when I was four, it was called infant school. Mm -hmm. And in infant school, I learned to say prayers to Our Lady. But I grew up as an Anglican. But the thing is, I felt at that moment that I could possibly just cry out to Our Lady. To ask for things like that, grounding, you know, to cleanse from the grounding grime of violence. And, and the, the mm. you know, the, or young men, who, people who lose their heads and, and even to the, the environment, because Jamaica used to have really tall palm trees, but there's a, a disease called lethal yellowing, which affects coconuts. Mm. 
Yeah. And I was praying for the palm trees to, you know, for re re recovery after lethal yellow cut down disease. So I was, as I was just calling out, yeah. a, you know, petition. And so, and it was the particular name of the parish that drew you to pray to Mary in that particular way. I think so. I wasn't conscious of it at the time, but I suspect so. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, I mean, I, I've read throughout some of your some of your autobiographies and memoirs the way that you speak about your mother and your your the stories you tell about your mother and in particular your mother's sewing room are so yes. powerful. You know, you say that she never charged what she should and that she used her sewing room um, for mending, of course, mending garments, but also mending so much else, mending um, distresses that were in people's lives, women's lives yes. and supporting and running really a women's community support center. Um, that's what we might yes. call it now fr from her sewing room. And a part of me wondered if you're um, if you're kind of praying to her in a certain sense in this, too, that she you're, you're, you're asking for a mending and is your mother in the background of this poem? I suspect she always is because my worldview is was so shaped by her and mm -hmm. her attitude towards she had a the most she had a capacity to care for incredible numbers of people. I mean, she had nine children, so she thought, well, I could just have nine more. And my <laughs> house was always filled with extra children and the people who grew up with us now, like brothers or sisters and and that was just how she saw life, that she could do this and one should do this. So yeah. she, yes, yeah, she's very much a seminal figure in all my poems. And she, I keep thinking she's going away, but she, she, this, she's, not, she's not going anywhere. She keeps reappearing in my poems. Because <laughs> yeah. one of your earlier collections was called, was it I Am Becoming My Mother? Yes, that yes. The second collection of yours? Yeah. Yes, it was, yes. Did she ever... Did she ever comment on her place in your poems or? Well, uh, very quickly, I tell you, very, um, one of the first poems I wrote for her was a long praise song called For My Mother May Inherit Half Her Strength. And I told a story about her life and her marriage and things like that. And I showed it to her and she says, you've told the whole world my business. And I felt really badly. I felt, you know, I had done this mm -hmm. terrible thing. But then a marvelous thing happened. I, I started reading it in different places and people would say, that's the story of my parents. And then I was in London once and I gave a reading and this little boy gave me his book and he said, I want to copy that poem because it's a story of my grandparents and I'm from Italy. So I went back and I told her, it's not your business. It's a lady <laughs> from Italy's business. You don't have to worry about it anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and did she take that? <laughs> she had a good sense of humor, yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you'd need to with nine children and then so many other people that she was caring for as well. Yes. Um, there's a real sense in this poem, you know, with the prayers to Our Lady um, and in so much of your work, there's a real sense of church hymns. And I know that you, you've spoken about how there was lots of church hymns in your youth. Um, like just to give people an example about other places of your work where there's a sense of church hymns in the in the language and in the tone and the music even you've got one poem called I shall light a candle to understanding in thine yes. heart which uh, shall yeah. not be put out yeah. there's so much ways yes, within which a certain approach to hymnody comes through your work where's the music of that coming from for you well, that particular poem you know, is a quotation from the book of Estras in the, in the Apocrypha. And you know, I can say it for you really quickly and you can hear it. It says, I shall, oh, light yeah. a, I shall light a candle of understanding in thine heart, which shall not be put out. I shall light first debts to pay and fences to mend. Then later rest the wounded past, the foes disguised as friends. I shall light a candle of understanding. Cease the training of impossible hedges round this life. For as fast you sow them, serendipity stick it will appear and outgrow them. I shall light a candle of understanding in thine heart. All things in the place then in this many chambered heart. For each thing a place and for him a place apart. I shall light a candle of understanding in thine heart, which shall not be put out. And by the hand that lit the candle, by the never to be extinguished flame. By the candle wax, which wind worry drips in the candle wings, luminous and rare. By the illumination of that candle, exit death and fear and doubt. 
hear love and possibility within a lit heart shining out. <laughs> That's so moving. I always feel like your poems are like lullabies for adults, <laughs> where there's an awareness of life can be difficult. Like this isn't just for soothing the anxious dreams of a child. This is for soothing the, the, the complicated experiences that adults hold, the regrets we hold, and that mm -hmm. your poems with no shame offer a sense of comfort, but there's no naivety in that comfort. No, no. You know, there's no, there's no cheap grace at work here, I don't think, mm. you know, but, um, no. you know, but I'm, I'm very you know, drawn to consoling. I grew up in the Anglican church. My, my mother was a diehard Anglican. And so we, I grew up every day going to school after I left infant school. Every single day of my life was marked by the singing of a hymn, a good Anglican hymn in the morning and sometimes in the evening when we were dismissed. So I grew up with the, the hymns of, of, Key, of John Keeble, the, Wes, the Wesleys. I grew up with, you know, John Newton. I grew up with, you know, William, um, yeah, William Blake with the Jerusalem. We, we sung, and I, I, I just know those hymns are hardwired into me. So I suspect mm. when I came to write, that foundation was already laid there. And I cannot, I, I, I like poetry that re references music somewhat. And, and just that, that foundation, that ground of my being, which is sort of laid down carefully yeah. with those hymns. I think, I don't think they'll ever leave my mm. voice. And I think that's where they come from in the poems. And do you find them consoling for yourself? Too oh, Lorna? deeply Do they so. have to work for you first of all? Oh, absolutely. I, last night I was thinking about some, I kept saying, like I will sing Lead Kindly Light, you know, John, Mm. You, you know, you know I, I just, Cardinal Newman, I will just, I, that's a great, great, great hymn. And um, mm. there's so many, a, a lot of hymns that are like were written by women. You know, I love Christina Rossetti, something yeah. like, you know, In mm. the Deep Bed Winter. That's, that's a, that's a oh. great song. <laughs> it's a great carol. Yeah. yeah. Snow on Snow. On, yeah. Yes. I mean, one time when we were talking before, I was asking you as to whether you are a formal member of a religion. And you said you're far too unruly a woman to be a formal <laughs> member of religion. <laughs> uh, Is that what you'd still say? <laughs> yes, but, you know, old habits. I, I go, I, I go to the, Ang I attend the Anglican church. Okay. I go to the Anglican Cathedral in Vancouver, especially on high feast days and, and holidays. Mm. And, but I like, I love taking, I love the Eucharist. I love just, I, I love what happens during the Eucharist. And it's, it's very consoling. And, I've, and I guess, yeah, I'm unruly. That is true. But I do, I, I, I've not strayed too far from my upbringing as a good Anglican. Okay. I, more than, more than just, that, I, I love, I, I, I have respect for every religion and all people's religions, you know. Yeah. And that'll come up in some of the poems we're going to look at in a while. Yes. I wonder if you could read um, Our Blessed Country Lady again from Morakabessa. Sure. Our Blessed Country Lady. From my brown cup freckled with white dots, I'd sip mint or fever grass tea, fresh or sweetened with spoonful of logwood honey, and I'd watch for Our Blessed Country Lady. She who carried a load on her head, usually a pile of the island's crosses, she delected to bear for the ones who could not manage them themselves. No matter how my own day had been, whether or not a poem came or a painting or a job to pay the rent, I greet her as she descended the side of the mountain, shifting those burdens slow so dark did not fall all at once. She'd hail me back and say, thanks for the greeting. I would love to come in and see what you do today, but I am on haste. For I have to take this dirty bundle down to the river and wash it out to sea. That way, when morning come again, some can start over clean. <laughs> the word redemption is throughout um, your work. I've seen it come up in your prose. Um, and it, it seems to me like this woman, the, 
blessed country woman is um, doing the work of redemption. Absolutely. Yes. I, and I believe that to be true. When I was growing up, I don't know if this is, this happens as much now, but women all over the island would, when they were doing laundry, they'd be singing hymns. And they, it seemed that, 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 that those two things went together, the washing of clothes mm. and the singing of hymns. So mm. I think a lot, and there are a lot of people like that, I think, who just are, who take care of the world. They have no official yeah. job, uh, you know, designation and they don't get paid for it but they, they they take care of the world yeah you, you i mean the the poem here is so visual you can see it um and i think your your training as a painter comes out in some of those particular poems where there's a tremendous visual nature to the to the yes. poem could you describe some of the scene that you that you were seeing when this poem came to you well i lived in the, near the blue mountains in jamaica and they're, mm. they're lovely you should come and see them they're, you know, they're about 7,000 feet on that. high. Yes. <laughs> but I lived for many years. I lived there up there. And um, I'd be sometimes I'd be painting outside and the ladies or the, the, the people who lived in up the hill would come down the hill and they'd call out to me. What are you painting today? Or I'd, they'd stop and look at what I was doing. So I was just thinking about being in that space and, you know, just seeing the blessed country lady coming down with her bundle and, we are, we're having a conversation about my my creative endeavors and hers, really. You know, I think that's yeah. what I was thinking. But mostly, I just wanted yeah. to honor our blessed country lady, who lives everywhere, every society. Hmm. You know, women like that can be found, and something like that always reminds me how Christianity and um, Islam, I mean, Judaism, all the great religions had humble beginnings. You know, they're, they were not started by, <laughs> you know, the people, what, what, what did Jesus say? They like their file after, they wear their file after is long. And yep. they like the, oh, best, yeah. the best seat in the synagogue and salutations in the marketplace, not those mm. people. <laughs> yeah. One of the things that I love about this woman and the poem, The best, Blessed Country Lady, that she's able to help people without making them feel ashamed for the help they need. Absolutely. And often I think that's 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 such a sophisticated way of helping because so often help can come with all kinds of um, debts, you know, be gr yes. be grateful to me or show your deference to me or recognize that this is charity. And that can feel really shaming, actually. But this woman takes joy in what she's doing, but she doesn't shame other people. That's the impression I get. That's so true. And she's also discreet with her help because she's going at the end of the day. She's not doing it in the middle of the day where everybody can see what she's doing. Mm. You know. She's not letting her left hand know what her right hand is doing, as <laughs> Jesus said. We should. <laughs> yeah. Um, I I think there's something really interesting in the work that you do as a poet, in that like so much of poetry has sometimes worked on great techniques of cleverness, and you know you've published so much, and you're very adept at all kinds of forms and all kinds of clever arrangements. You know you've you've worked in all in and out of all those kinds of forms, but there's an open heartedness to your work that doesn't hide behind cynicism or irony. There is a sense that when need is needful, it's just said plainly and said mm -hmm. clearly. What is it about that kind of level? of using the profundity of your skills as a poet, but never letting those skills get in the way of speaking from an open heart that seems to be so much of interest to you, Lorna. Some of the writers I admire the most, I, I'm a big fan of Thomas Merton, like everybody is too. Mm. But one of his great gifts was that he would, was able to present the most complex ideas with the, most, with the clearest, most distilled language. And I think that's a real gift. And that's something mm. that I would I aim for. I do not always succeed, but I think it's something to aim for. Needless obfusc obfuscation is not, it might show how clever you are, but it might not. Because sometimes, you know, you really need a message and you need it quickly and you need to receive it directly, you know? You know, and mm. that, that, that wonderful thing about the word, the good word, a word in season. You know, I yeah. love that thing the, the prophet Isaiah says it, something I, I don't, I'm, paraphrase something that like the Lord has given me the tongue of those who are taught that I might know how to sustain him that it, 
him that is weary. And I've mm -hmm. always thought that was a gift, that was a job of poets, really, <laughs> to sustain with a word. The tongue of those who are taught to sustain with a word somebody that is weary. Mm -hmm. And it cannot be too complex or dense or ironic if that is the, the job you're given to do. Yeah. Does that, does that make sense? <laughs> It makes complete sense. Yeah. And I'm struck by how much of a challenge to the to the poetry community, the words that you're using there are to speak about almost a function of poetry, to say that if it's there to uplift a heart, don't try to be too clever about it because yeah. the message yeah. might be interrupted by yourself, by your own yeah. cleverness. Yes. <laughs> I have poems that I'm, I'm, I'm embarrassed by for that reason. I thought, so you were showing off that you knew that. But really, honestly, the poems I'm most proud of or taken with or feel most satisfied with are the ones where I have no idea where they came from. Mm. Something happened and I wrote them and I, 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 spent a, I spend a lot of time on my work. I do constant revisions. I, it's, I'm not one of these people who says, oh, I wrote it and then I never touched it again. No, I, yeah. I work, I work, I work away all, constantly. But even at the end of it, I stepped back and I thought, I don't know where that came from. Mm. And those are the poems I really value. Mm. Yeah. Mm. We're going to, in a while, talk about what for me seems like one of those poems, because it's a, a poem of a cacophony of all kinds of things that are happening. <laughs> but I, I wanted to give people uh, an opportunity to see some of your work, uh, some of your painting work Laura, as well. So I wonder if... Um, ben, you'd be able to share that image there. That's um, Mothers of Revival. Is that right? Is that an excerpt from that painting? Yes, uh, uh, it's a, quite a long painting. It keep, that's a, yes, that's an excerpt. Yeah. yeah, and it's the cover of this book, Arakabessa, that yes. I can hold up the book here. But um, there's what, what are you seeing in that? There's such beautiful blues, almost suggesting water. It, there, there is water. I, 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 as I said, I lived up in the Blue Mountains and the Hope River runs through the area where I live. That's the name of the river. It's called the Hope River. Mm -hmm. And um, people who are in, you know, members of various African religions, which are syncretizations of African and European religions, like revival yeah. or Pocomania, things, they often do baptisms in the river. And that would be from seeing some people at a baptism in the river yes and that the blue is meant to suggest water uh, and one of the women is carrying a cross like a staff yes. is that right? she yeah. a lot of in those churches many of the leaders are women and they're called mm. the mother of the church mm. it's a beautiful painting and um, sometime i must find out if if there are uh, if there's a full version of that um to, to see online somewhere or a picture of it i, I try to um, get I've one seen too. different corners it, of it <laughs> okay yeah um you know i i always think that your poetry locates prayer um and even sacrament and liturgy in the everyday that sometimes it feels like it's a, a, a poem of consolation and a balm mm -hmm. that could be said in the back of a bus when you're carrying shopping or you're surrounded by noise. Um, I and so. I wonder if you could read. Yeah, <laughs> but I wonder if you could read I am a love siren because, you know, it's a bit of a longer poem than the other ones you've read um, for us today, today. But I feel like that poem is filled with um the, the interruptions of everyday life. And maybe yes. you want to kind of locate us a little bit before you read it, if you think that might help people follow along with the poem. Sure. It's a longish poem, and it was written, uh, it began to take shape in the back of a taxi very early one morning. Uh, I was on my way to the airport in Kingston, and my son was with me, half asleep. And we were in this sort of hermetically sealed space very early in the morning, and the radio is on. And there's a woman singing a very strident, very, very strong voice, singing us a, a hymn called I'm a Love Siren. And so all these kinds, these are like thoughts that I, I was free associating, I guess, as I drove along. And then, you know, so I will see, for example, a long mountain. I notice a long mountain coming into view. And a wonderful poet by the name of Philip Sherlock had a marvelous poem. He's called uh, the Long Mountain Rise. So I referenced him and his wife, whose name is Grace. And then I saw a, a, a young Rastafarian driving a flock of goats. 
This is early in the morning. So I will reference King David because he too tended the flocks. And then I found there, there are all these references, just one to um to that that references the Quran where I start to pray for my son. Yeah. And I remember one of those. This is from the exordium, I think, that asks to keep him on the straight path, which is a wish I think we all, everybody would want for any, any child. So, okay, here I go. I am a love siren. Yeah. On Irie FM at 5 a.m., a church sister kickstarts an extended play that segues seamless from him to him. Measured in airwaves, it's as long as Airdrie to Old Hope and Mountain View, where the sister Shanty Claire's the great stones mother got to move. I, mother of my sweet son, who half sleeps in the next seat, cannot kick it steam engine style, like the cistern on Ari FM, who cuts and clears across the length of Long Mountain Range. But as we part Nannyville, I bid sleeping troubles stand still. As the sister orchestrates removal of the great stones, I swear I see Elder Philip turning a roll. He's trumping with exquisite grace along the shoulders of Long Mountain Range, Cyrene. By Seymour lands, we passed a dread herding a fat flock of goats. They have cropped all night on the verdant grass in Mr. Marcus Garvey's Edelweiss Park. And now Shepherd Dread is leading them home to pasture on scorched hillsides of Warika, feed they will feed on dry paper and police maca till nightfall, when they will descend again, sure-footed to graze in green pasture. Sudden break and a dreadlock salute, a flash of locks, then plunges the eye off into moving ranks of goat. Oh, Dread, King David was a shepherd too, tender to his father's flocks, same as you. And one day he was summoned in, chosen all before and anointed. The cistern is now catching our length, Cyrene. Praise to the unfettered spirit that bids us go and come again. Praise the key man compassionate, who releases from hard bondage. I go now, please, Ja, to come again. Watch over sweet spirit, my sweet son. Keep Ja, keep him safe from harm. Keep him guide spirit on the straight path, not the path of those who have earned your wrath, nor of the wayward gone astray. Keep us safe in your everlasting arms, everlasting mercy upon us all, to the ones I love and the ones who love me. To all the rest, take this love, peace. Channeling, channeling through the Holy Ghost cistern. Cistern, who's a siren. I love Sarene. <laughs> I love this poem so much, Lorna. Thank you. Because um, it's a it's a it's a hymn of praise to the radio as well yes, as to everybody is, that you're yes, seeing yes. around. Yeah. I also want to just mention the everlasting mercy. One of my favorite book long books, a long book of poetry, is um, everlasting. You don't know that marvelous poem, the everlasting mercy. By John Maysfield. I don't think I do. It's, no, a, it's, I don't. A, it's I quite marvelous, up. yes. So I had to mm. get John Maysfield in there because that, that's one of the uh -huh. poets I learned at school. And, on, and oh. because, if you will ask me about the sea later, I will tell you that because of John Maysfield, I have hardwired into me all the, like, see, as, you know, like for no reason, I will find myself saying, it's a sunny, pleasant anchorage up there is kingdom come where Cruz is always laying aft for double tots or rum, and there's dancing and fiddling of every kind of sort. It's a fine place a sailor men is that their port. And I wish, I wish as I was there. I, for no reason, I say that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they're just, they're, they're just lodged in you. That's beautiful. Yes. <laughs> um, well, there's so much music, even in the way that you recite that. The, I think the poems that we've learned off by heart from when we were younger um, stay in us in a particular way. Oh, yes, um, I do. All this last year, I've been reciting Yeats to myself because we learned so oh. much W.B. Yeats in school growing up. Lucky and, you. you know, 
Yeah, well, you know, you've been told to wash your hands for 20 seconds, you know, 15 times a day. And the government here were saying, sing happy birthday to yourself twice. And I was like, my God, what a waste of time. <laughs> so I started to recite um, to a child dancing in the wind, which is a lovely oh. short Yeats poem. And it's about 20 seconds long. So that Can I would, you um, say it? recite that to myself. Can you recite it to me? Um, I'd like yes. to hear it. <laughs> yes. Um, to a child dancing in the wind. Dance there upon the shore. What need you have to care for wind or water's roar and tumble out your hair that the salt drops have wet. Being young, you have not known the fool's triumph, nor yet love lost as soon as won, nor the best laborer dead, nor all the sheaves to bind. What need you have to dread the monstrous crying of the wind. Oh, <laughs> so some it's very stunning. performative. Yes, it's marvelous. Wouldn't cheer a child yeah. up, but you know. <laughs> yeah, I know. Um, yeah, and Beautiful. I've known that poem off by heart since I was since I was eleven. Yes. Um, I mean, I I want to talk about prayer because prayer comes into the end of this poem. But we've kind of gotten on. You mentioned the ocean, and I often feel like something like God is present in your poems when you mention the ocean, when you mention water, it's there like a cleansing balm. Yes, and, and, and also ultimately unknowable and certainly ungovernable mm -hmm. and certainly, the, you know, them, it, what, it is what is the most myster mysterious of all, you know. I, I, I think the fact that it, it just does what it wants from moment to moment, I find just, I'll tell you something, Every day I go out and I see at least one thing that I feel is a gift to me from the sea. You know, maybe I'm, I'm here too long or something, but I do believe this. Um, my mother's, one of my mother's sisters, she had four sisters and one of them, two of them, three of them emigrated to, to Montreal, Canada. And one of them married a man called Mr. Seal. Did I tell you this? But um, so I, but every, I'm, I'm two oceans and two seas away from my family. And sometimes it gets really lonely. I really miss mm. them. But mm. every now, when I feel like that, I always see the seal. And I think, oh, that's my, mo <laughs> my mother's people come to say hello to me. You know? <laughs> that's lovely. But, yes. I don't know. I, I shouldn't tell people you... that. It sounds, I don't know, strange. <laughs> but... I, I get well, these. no, I mean, I think there's all kinds of consolation. Yes. But there's all kinds of consolation we can get from the sea. Absolutely. And, and I'm I love so that interested idea. that you. No, please. Oh, I think there's a slight delay. I'm so interested that you say that the first thing you say when you think of the sea as possibly an image of God is how ungovernable it is. And that yes. is so clear to you. I mean, that wouldn't fit so well to theology textbooks, even though I think it should. And yet I think you're making a really strong point here from a poet's point of view about the, the necessity of recognizing the ungovernability of God. Are we frozen? Maybe I am. I, I, my, one of my mother's favorite hymns, which has become one of mine, is God moves in a mysterious way, his wonders to perform. He plants his footsteps on the sea and rides upon the storm. Deep in unfathomable minds of never failing skill, he treasures up his bright designs and works his sovereign will. I know all of it, but I won't go on. But I like the idea that <laughs> God moves in a mysterious way, you know. Mm. It's not, and mystery leaves you with more and more questions. Magic mm. is manipulation, but mystery just gives you, leaves you, every time you think, it just leaves, gives you another question, another question, another question. It's not to be solved or penetrated or nailed down. Yeah. Well, that's a nice segue into talking about prayer. And um, after this question about prayer, um, we'll open up the possibility for people to write in some um, questions uh, in the chat there uh, that might want to be brought to, to you. You know, people can write it in or they can send it to Ben or they can speak it out themselves if they're willing to do that. But I, I would like to talk to you about prayer, like this last poem. Um, you know, it, it, you, you think of your sleeping son next to you, your sweet son, you call him. <laughs> um, then I go now, please, Jat, come again, watch over my sweet spirit. Watch over sweet spirit, my sweet son. 
please keep Ja, keep him safe from harm. Keep him guide spirit on the straight path. There's so much raw yearning in that prayer. Mm -hmm. Again, filled with beauty and filled with wide reading, but filled with rawness as well and vulnerability in prayer. Well, I don't know how you pray, but um, I speak Jamaican Creole. You know, I'm sure you have some sort of dialect that you speak, you know. Yeah. And um, when I pray, I inv invariably pray in my in, in Creole. I, I might start mm -hmm. off with, when I'm reading, like from the Book of Common Prayer. I, I, and, I, and I love that language. That's the most beautiful, unordinary language. I think mm -hmm. as somebody described it. But when I'm really, really, when it's, it's the petition, it's, it's a fervent petition. I, 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 I speak in Creole, I speak Pato, you know, I just said, God, you have to help mm. me, you know, <laughs> that kind of thing. So, because it's, it's a, the language of my heart, and I, I just, I, sincerity, you have to be just absolutely sincere about this, you know. I don't know, and I love numinous, it's a word I, I really love. That, that mm. wonderful mystery in the everyday, that the transcendent yeah. in the everyday. And one of the things you do so powerfully in your work is like this poem has got such um, vulnerable, open hearted prayer for your son. And at the same time, too, you're recasting the biblical character of King David yes. in this <laughs> Rastafarian guy who's in front of you. And there's a post colonial project that's happening in your poetry that Absolutely. is as powerful as it is tender. And it's amazing the way you hold those two together. I think love and justice. I, I think that is what, you know, I, a friend of mine told me a long time ago, he said, your poems can be divided up into just two categories, poems about love and po poems about justice. But I think they have to go together, you know, love without, love without justice is, is useless, you know, it's, and um, yeah, and justice without love is tyranny and terrible things. And we're seeing a lot of that in the world, you know. Yeah. I'm going to hand over to my colleague, Ben, who might want to bring in some questions from the, the congregation of the faithful and the good <laughs> who are here with us <laughs> from all over the world. That's so nice of them. Uh, thank you so much, Padraig and Lorna. Um, I've been enjoying, uh, I've, I've been making a lot of noises over here, so it's been good to be on mute, just a lot of like, oh, yes, or laughing, um, just feeling a lot. And I can see um, the faces of many of our gathered friends here that, uh, we're all just feeling very uh, present and enjoying this conversation. Um, so as Padraig said, we, we do have uh, space now for a few questions, um, probably about three or four questions. And um, here's the, the two options for how to bring your question forward. One is, uh, if you'd like to ask the question out loud, um, then what you can do is there's a raise your hand function in Zoom. Uh, depending on your, your edition of Zoom, uh, if you click it, it might be in a different place. Um, it can either be on the far left, um, a button where you raise your hand, or it's in the reactions. There's a little smiley face with a plus on the bottom right. And um, if you click that, you'll see a raise your hand function. And so if you do that, um, you know, then what will happen is uh, we'll call on you and spotlight your video and unmute your audio, um, invite you to unmute your audio so you can ask a question directly. And again, if you do choose that option, you're giving your, your permission for, um, to be recorded for our Zoom uh, recordings. So uh, that's one way. The other way is you can drop it right now into the chat. Um, so if you don't wanna be spotlighted, don't wanna raise your hand, that's fine. So you can just drop a question there in the chat. You could also message me directly if you have a question and don't want to put it um, in front of all the participants. So um, yeah, we invite you to do so now. And I do see a hand from my fellow uh, Milwaukee citizen, Rayren. Rayren, thanks for being with us and invite you to uh, bring your question. OK, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Yeah. Okay, wonderful. <laughs> Lona, thank you so much. This was so beautiful. Okay. Um, I would love to hear a poem in Creole. Do you, can you, do you write uh, poems in Creole? 
I have written one poem in that's entirely in Creole. I code switch. I, 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 do both. I, I write the way I think in my head, which is, you know, I go back and forth between Creole and um, English. standard English. But I can say the poem for you. Very, is, can I do this very quickly? Say the I poem. It. It's called The Road of the Dread. And it's called, it says, that the road not paved like any other black face road. It not have no definite color and it fence two sides with live barbed wire. And look for no milepost to measure your walking and take nothing as dead or familiar because sometimes you'll pass a thing called stone and there's a snake ready for squeeze you, kill you, or it's a dead man taking possession, tease you. And then the place them you go before they as well as resting, place them you know as resting place because time before they go there, you're welcome like rain, go there again, bad dog, bad face turn to drive you underground where you don't have no light for walk. And many of me who said them understand, it's only from the mouth them talk. One thing though, that same treatment will make you walk untold distance. For to continue, you have to walk far away from the wicked. Some day don't have no definite color. It just named day or night, as how you feel to call it. Then why I tread it, sister? When make I tell you about the days when the father sent some little bird that swallow flute for trim me? Or a breeze like a laugh follow me? Or the one fan of stream that pure like a baby mine and the water quiet ease on your throat and quiet inside. And some days you meet another traveler who have flour and you have water and a one on one make bread together. And those days the road just runs straight and sure like a young horse that cannot tire. And I catch a glimpse of the end through the water in my eye. And I won't tell you what I spy, but it's for loan that alone that I tread this road. Okay, and that's mostly in Creole, but it's, it's a journey poem. It's about somebody setting out on life's journey, you know. Thank you very much. That was beautiful. Thank you. What a gift. Thank you so much. I had the same question, so I'm, I'm glad that question was brought forward. Uh, does anyone else have uh, a question they'd like to offer, either in the chat or by raising your hand? And maybe while we're waiting, Lauren, I'd be curious to know what is it about um, moving between different languages for you that wh when do you feel your way into that? And what are some of the things that are happening underneath that? Some there's some words in, in Creole that are irreplaceable. Mm -hmm. There's no word in standard English that approaches the richness of it. The, the you know, the, the, the feel of it on the tongue, because that's important, mm -hmm. too, you know. Yeah. So there are just sometimes when I don't care what the, the context is, I just have to use that Creole word or that, you know, or that way that declension or just some of the lovely things that we say. You know, like I said earlier on at the beginning, am I going too fast? Because I tend to babble when I get excited. I have That's to slow. <laughs> but, um, you know, how Jamaicans say, I will do my endeavor best. That's just something I just love. And, it, you know, instead of saying I will do my utmost, I prefer yeah. my endeavor best, you know. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, we do have a question from Michelle, who's actually one of our partners at the Washington National Cathedral. And um, I'll, I'll preface it by saying it's a question about the Book of Common Prayer. And um, if you have a favorite prayer from that book, but while you're thinking of that, I'll just share with, for those of you who aren't familiar, um, the Book of Common Prayer is, um, is very often used in, I mean, it's a central book for, for prayers and liturgy uh, that's used in the Anglican church. Um, so I, I'm seeing here, I just pulled this up because I, you know, this isn't something I memorized, but the original is actually published in uh, 1549, um, but it has evolved over time. So there's a, a long history and, and many communities that have used this, uh, Christian communities that have used this book in their in their worship practice and other things. So, and Lorna, you can add anything else because I'm sure you're more familiar with, with it than me. Well, but, I have um, it by my bedside, but that's upstairs. I could run and get mine for you. But I, the thing is the, the language is, 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 is peerless. I think some of the best writers and minds of that time came together to write that. And um, there, I, I love everything. I, I love those, you know, like this, the, the marriage ceremony, the bapt ceremonies for baptism. You know the confession. The um, it it, it it contains that liturgy that you use in you know in the Anglican Church, and um, 
I wouldn't say I have a favorite, except that I, I like, ju there are just little touches like, you know, like the co when you confess your sins and you're absolved, you can, you know, because there's a phrase I like that says, you know, because you know that we're most miserable offenders. <laughs> and um, you don't use language like that anymore. Nobody's willing to fess up to being a miserable offender, but we are. And I think that, should, that is where a book like that is valuable to remind us that sometimes we are most miserable offenders and that the, the, burdens of our, the burden of our sins is unbearable. It says things like that instead of, you know, I don't, I'm uncomfortable with this. No, it says the burden is intolerable, it's unbearable. And I'm a miserable offender. <laughs> hmm. but, sorry. I love in the, is it in the prayer of confession? Is it in the prayer of confession, Lorna, that um it speaks about the devices and desires of our heart? Oh yes, 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 it does. Hmm. Mm. Follow too I, much. The, what do you think? The, sorry. Yes, we have too followed too much the devices, the devices and, and desires, desires of our, of our heart. heart. Oh. You can't say that what any is it better. That that line does? Because, <laughs> because we all want to not admit that we follow the devices and desires of our the la it's a language, just the, the, the way, you know the way those these fall and the you know device is such an interesting word. Mm. You know, it is it there's somewhere in there there's a trap, you know. <laughs> there's something that, that catches you in a device and, and a vice and yeah, all of that. So yeah. we do have another question um, from uh, from Kathy, um, and Kathy, I'm going to ask to unmute you, and um, because we had a problem with the raise raise your hand feature, so let me ask to unmute, and then we'll try to um, spotlight you as well. I think you unmuted me. Oh, we can hear you now. All right, great. Um, Lorna, thank you for being here. This is amazing. I, you've lifted up my heart and soul so much. Thank you. What a blessing. Um, I think that you, besides your discussions about Mother Mary, um, I really was touched when you said that you were embarrassed at first by your poetry, and then you decided to fess up and be who you were called to be, a poet. So I, that gave me a lot of strength because I'm also called to be a writer and I've just started my, the querying and agent process. Mm -hmm. And it's very intimidating and daunting and terrifying. And perhaps you might have advice for other writers in the audience like myself who are just beginning our writer's journey, hopefully the publication. Thank you. Well, I, I think what I just say is congratulations, you know, that, that's a noble calling, you know, being a writer. And just, just, I'm sure there are things you have to say that nobody knows, nobody has said before. And those are the things that the world needs, your, your, your authentic truth. You know, just, just, and you can, I know when I read something and it's, you know, it's authentic, and it, it, you know, it, it, it passes in some ways, you know, Emily Dickinson said, if I read a book and I feel so cold as if no fire will ever warm me, or if I feel as if I'm physically losing the top of my head, then I know it's a poem. That's a litmus test. <laughs> that's, a, that's a hard litmus test. But um, <laughs> you, you write, write in a way that, just if you can bear in mind something like that. You know, that <clears throat> so what I'm saying is it shouldn't try as much as possible not to be looking to the market and looking to the trends, the latest, you know? Just if you have some great truth that might really lift up some souls, that, you know, th that you have a duty to put it out there and just put your, just be authentic. And somehow, I don't know, I'm not being Pollyannish, but things, I, I, I got my first real poems published because I worked at a, an advertising agency and everybody knew that when I was sick of writing about ads for trucks and jewelry and things like that. I was a copywriter that I'd lock my door and write and work on my poems. I one day a guy came by who was uh, one of the, the, he worked in the production department and he said, give me some of those poems you're always working on and I'm take it down to the Jamaica Journal. 
because I'm doing something for them. And he did. And he came back and he said, they liked your poems. <laughs> and that's how, you know, so I was in my office. I should, maybe I should not have been working on my poems anyway, but I did. So I'm saying somehow when it's right, things begin to present themselves in, 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 you know, in the right way. You, you, you understand what I'm saying? Oh, yeah. Okay. Thank you, Kathy. Uh, we're going to uh, close our Q&A time. I, I'm, I'm sorry we can't get to everyone. We really appreciate your, your questions, both the ones that have come in the chat and some privately to me. Um, hopefully in our remaining moments here, you might even hear answers to some of the questions you have. Um, but we're going to invite Tammy to ask the final question. Wow, thank you. That's a lot of um, pressure. Thank you so much, um, Ben. And no, pres no pressure, no pressure. <laughs> thank you so much, Ben and Lorna and Padraig. Um, what a wonderful conversation. I just listened to the Poetry Unbound episode with the, um, Queen Isabella. I'm sorry, I'm forgetting the name. Queen Isabella, yeah. Yeah, and the, the question that she asks on said at the end is just so powerful where at the very end the answer is and yes your majesty there were people and i wonder if there are other moments in poems where um that you've written that you think there's a question that's not been directly asked but that your poems are speaking to if there's just a, yeah. a moment that you share oh i'd have to think really hard but i, I think i, I can I, I, I'm not sure I can come up with an example, but I'm sure I must have done that because that's a huge, have you ever wondered about that particular thing? I mean, there are people living there when Columbus came to all these places, you know? So it's kind of, it's like, I would just come into your house and say, yeah, I've discovered you, but I'm not going that, that you know, but <laughs> I, I, I just wonder, well, anyway, I, I'm babbling again, but I'll, I tell you what, if I think of another example before we're done, I'll tell you. But for now, I, I just can't seem to find one. I'm sure I must have one somewhere. <laughs> but thanks for asking. Tammy, thank you so much for that question. It actually is the, the perfect um, transition into how we're going to close our time together. So um, Tammy mentioned uh, a Poetry Unbound episode with one of Lorna's poems. And that poem is reporting back to Queen Isabella. And this is the second poem that's come out in our third season of Poetry Unbound, which um, just started last week. And uh, we had sort of a playful exchange before we went live today. But, um, but Padraig actually, I mean, since he reflects on the poem and reads it in Poetry Unbound, which um, Lily will be dropping a link in the chat for you so you can follow up with it after. But Padraig's gonna read it here. And I think he might be a little embarrassed reading in front of Lorna, but Lorna no, can't wait. No, so that's that's what we're going to do. Um, we're going to have an Irishman read um, the poem of a Jamaican woman. And um, and then they're going to yeah. talk about it a little bit as we close our time. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> there's a there's a local word here called scundered, which means when you're really embarrassed. And I'm scundered <laughs> reading your poem to you, Lorna. Do anyway. not be scundered. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> well, I am. Anyway, reporting back to Queen Isabella. When Don Cristobal returned to a hero's welcome, his caravels corked with treasures of the new world, he presented his findings, told of his great adventures to Queen Isabella, whose speech set the gold standard for her nation's language. When he came to Jamaica, he described it so, the fairest isle that eyes ever beheld, then he balled up a big sheet of parchment, unclenched and let it fall off a flat surface before it landed at her feet. There we were, massives, high mountain ranges, expansive plains, deep valleys, one he'd christened for the Queen of Spain. Over abundance of wood, over 100 rivers, food and fat pastures for Spanish horses, men and cattle. And yes, your majesty, there were some people. Oh, that's brilliant. I could, you read it much better than I do. <laughs> I don't Thank believe you. it. <laughs> that well, was wonderful, Patrick. Beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. 
this this poem is so extraordinary, Lorna, and I was so glad that Tammy was bringing it up. Like that last part, and yes, Your Majesty, there were some people. There's so much pomp and dehumanization happening in this um, extravagant court. Yes, yes. Um, I, it, it, I, I've traveled in, I went to Spain once and, you know, you, well, first of all, I, I, I wanted to say something good about Columbus before I, I'm, I'm trying to do that, in that he clearly was a very brave man. He was not a coward because those caravels were not very big ships. You know, when I actually saw one to scale it, they're not enormous. So, I mean, good, good you know, props to him. I, I really applaud him for his bravery and his courage. But the, 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 this whole new world, the, the, the vent, what happened to, you know, the, 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 the Amerindians, what happened to the, you know, the, the native population when you're, it, it just, it just kind of breaks you. I don't know what to say except if somewhere in there, the people could have come earlier, <laughs> you know, like I came mm -hmm. and yes, it's a beautiful place and there are lots of nice people. And then they, but I think that it was always a people were an afterthought yeah. and it's, you know, and um, this, he actually took some of them back to Spain with him and you mm -hmm. can imagine how wretched and then put them on display as, you know, yeah, I don't know. like, mm -hmm. And it, mm -hmm. it just, I don't know. I, I'm not answering a question because honestly, I do not know what to say about something as heartrending as that, you know? Yeah. Like in the line there, we were massive high mountain ranges. And you were saying about how the word massive is a, a kind of a, a patois word for people, you know? Yes, I, 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 feel I like... love that. <laughs> no, you <Yeah>. go ahead. <laughs> Well, I, I feel like you're speaking for all colonized peoples, indigenous and enslaved peoples, by saying there we were. This yes. wasn't a new world. This no. was a world that was as old as the rest of the world. Yes. And yeah. there's a there's a protest in this poem. Oh, absolutely. And um, the, the language of, you know, I told you, I think I wrote that poem when we were in Jamaica in the 1970s, we had a sort of mild socialist experiment. It, it, it didn't work out in some ways. Some ways it did. But um, when people were being referred, the language of the, 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 the zeitgeist, you know, was all about the masses. And um, Jamaican people don't accept things like that. So they said, no, we're not the masses, we're the massifs. Mm. And the massif is a mountain. You know, we're mountains. We're, we're you know, we're... So, um, yes, yeah, so there, there's a fear that that word plays in there, a nation language. Yeah, that is, you know, Edward Kamau Brathwaite, the great um, Barbadian poet, that was one of his great contributions to literature, his, um, his, you know, writings on na what he calls nation language, which, you know, Creole yeah. or Pato, but he gives it its proper, its, its, its due, yeah. and he calls it nation language. And it is true, apparently, mm -hmm. Queen Isabella's speech did set the standard for her, her nation's language. She had a lisp, I think, and people were, anyway. Yeah. I tend to go off on tangents, so yeah. I have to bring myself back in. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, um, there's been people commenting in the comments that they like your tangents and what you were calling babbling. <laughs> you were saying it is not babbling. It is, um, filled with information and curiosity and wonder. Oh. Um, oh, well, it is such a joy. We're coming close to the end. I'm going to hand back to Ben. I think he's got an announcement or two, and then we're going to hear a final poem from you, Lorna. Oh, lovely, lovely. Uh, you know, I, I wanted to, um, before I say a couple of, couple things, I, I wanted to come to one comment in the chat specifically because it feels especially important. Um, Lorna, there, there's a, a, another Jamaican woman here and she's just expressed how meaningful this has been. Um, and I don't, I don't know how to say, is it Patois? Is that, what's the, the language? Yep, that'll okay. Go. okay, that'll do. I'll take it. And um, <laughs> She, she's actually uh, wondering if if this is the only poem written in Patois, um, but she also loves that you pray in Patois. So I just wanted to call that one out specifically. It felt important. No, I think I, I have others that are mainly Patois, but I think um, somehow I keep switching back and forth. But now that I'm retired and I'm living by the sea and I have more time, <laughs> maybe I'll be writing more in Patois. <laughs> 
Yeah. We'll see. Thank you so much. Yeah. Um, so yeah, just to, to wrap this up before, um, in, in a few moments, we're actually going to invite Lorna to close our time with one more poem. Um, but uh, Lorna earlier said that the work of a poet is to sustain with a word someone that is weary. Yes. To sustain with a word someone that is weary. And I have a sense that, that especially through um, Lorna's poetry, and also through her conversation partner, Podrick, who's, who's a poet as well, um, that, that both of these poets have, have done their work uh, with us today. So um, thank you so much to Podrick and Lorna um, for sustaining us with these words and uh, creating this space for us. And on behalf of the On Being Project and the Washington National Cathedral, just a heartfelt thank you um, to everyone who attended for your presence, for your questions, um, and uh, we want to invite you to uh, give us some feedback, share how this experience has been for you. Lily will be adding a short survey in the chat now uh, so you can let us know what you think of this gathering. And it's a way for our social healing team at the On Being Project to, um, to stay in touch with you, to hear from you, and, and discern how we might be able to support you in whatever ways you are up to the work of social healing in your communities. Um, and uh, Lily, thank you so much for running the chat and setting so much of, of this up behind the scenes. Um, and uh, Lily and I would love to know if you're interested in connecting with our work in terms of the area of religious and spiritual life at On Being, yes. definitely fill out that survey. Um, also keep your eye out on YouTube for uh, recordings, uh, recording of this, as well as our previous Poetry Unbound uh, episodes. And a reminder that season three of um, Poetry Unbound uh, the podcast is now out wherever you get your podcasts. Our final Poetry Unbound Plus conversation is on Sunday, June 6th with poet Diane Glancy. And you can find out registration info through um, the On Being of Washington National Cathedral, the other ways you've heard from us. So um, like all of our conversations, it will be available afterward on YouTube. So thank you for um, hearing those announcements. And with that, I'll hand it back to Patrick. So, uh, Lorna, we'd be delighted to hear uh, another poem of yours. I had had the idea that maybe you could have reread the cleanse petition from the start, but you were saying that you've got another one in mind. So we're thrilled to hear yes. something that we're not prepared for, which is great joy. Good. It's, let me just say thank you so much. It's just been so lovely. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. It's called Turn Thanks to Grandmother Hannah. My grandmother Hannah aspired to sanctity through the domestic vocation of laundering the used soil vestments of the clergy into immaculate and unearthly brightness. She would wash, starch, and smooth them like the last few feet of the road to heaven with a heavy self-heater iron, its belly blazing with the harnessed energy of the coals of hell. Every clergyman in St. Elizabeth's parish would seek out her cleansing service. Reclaiming that which seemed marked for perdition was Hannah's holy gift. Wine-stained altar cloths, once chased white albs, would rejoice, spotless, transfigured to stand, redeemed under the resurrecting power of Grandmother Hannah's hands. To be perfect in whatsoever you're called to do is counted in heaven as sincere prayer. When well, my father's mother prayed through laundering the garments used in temple service. To my grandmother with the cleansing power in her hands, my intention here is to give thanks on behalf of any who might have experienced within something like the redemption in her washing. Lorna Goodison, thank you so much. Our deep, deep thanks and honor to you <laughs> for the joy and the power of your work. We're so in your gratitude. Thank you. Thank you.